let's take a look at some conservation of energy examples. And we'll start with this one. A box at the bottom of a frictionless ramp has an initial speed of 5 meters per second. What is the maximum height the box reaches on the ramp? So we'll draw a little diagram here, and we have to figure out what the system is going to be. Well, we don't have to worry about any other objects except for really the box. So let's make the system the box plus the Earth. Remember, it's important to include the Earth because that way we can have gravitational potential energy in our system. If the Earth is not in our system, there can't be any gravitational potential energy. Now you might ask, should we include the ramp? Well, the ramp doesn't interfere. It doesn't add or remove any energy from this system. It's just sort of there. Uh, there's no friction, so the ramp isn't involved except to apply normal force. And the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement, so there's no energy added or removed by that normal force. So it's a closed system if we have just a system made out of the box and the earth. If it's a closed system, we can say EI equals EF. The total energy at the beginning equals the total energy at the end. At the beginning, it only has kinetic energy. And at the end, when it reaches the top, well, at its final height, at its maximum height, it's not moving. So at that moment, it only has gravitational potential energy. So therefore, 1 half mvi squared is equal to mghf. Masses cancel out. We put in the information that we know. And if we do that, we can solve for the final height, 1.28 meters. In our next example, let's say an object is at rest. You apply a force, and while applying the force, you do 150 joules of work. If the object has a mass of 10 kilograms, you've applied that force. And you can assume that the object is on a flat, frictionless surface. So if we do that, well, let's see. Um, the object begins at rest, so it doesn't have any kinetic energy. Uh, you're applying a force, and you're doing some work. So if the system is the object, and we could include the Earth. So let's go ahead. Yeah, sure. Let's say it's the object plus the Earth then you're doing work on it. So this is an open system. Now, the reason why it's not really that important here to include the Earth, we did, just for the heck of it, but there's no gravitational potential energy involved. The height never changes. So we can just say that the height is always equal to zero. So in this situation, we started out, the object wasn't moving, so there was no kinetic energy. You did some work, and then that's going to equal the final kinetic energy at the end. And that way we can solve for the speed. So we have 0 plus 150 joules is equal to 1 half the mass times Vf squared. And if you solve for that final speed, you get 5.48 meters per second. All right, in the next one, a projectile is launched from the top of a 50 meter cliff. At launch, it moves at 30 meters per second. What is the projectile's speed when it is 20 meters above the ground? So draw a little diagram here, there's the projectile, there's the launch, okay, and it ends up, we want to know what speed it's moving at at 20 meters above the ground. Well, in this situation, nothing is adding or removing energy from the system. The only things that are involved are the projectile and the earth. So, if our system is the projectile and the earth, it's closed. Nothing is adding or removing energy. So, EI equals EF when it's closed. So, let's see, at the beginning, well, it has kinetic energy and potential energy at the beginning gravitational potential energy. And it has kinetic energy at the end and gravitational potential energy at the end. So we have this expression. Now, there's mass in every term here, so we can cancel out the mass. And if we do that, then we can put in the information that we know, the initial speed, the initial height. We don't know the final speed, but we do know the final height. And then we do the math, and you can solve for the final speed. 38.6 meters per second. All right, next one we'll look at. There's a book with a mass of two kilograms sliding on a flat surface. Initially, it moves at three meters per second, but then a friction force of 10 newtons acts on the book as it slides, and it slows to a stop. Determine the displacement of the book. Now, I'm asking you to use energy, not force in kinematics. You could totally use force in kinematics to solve this, but we're going to use energy. So here's the situation. All right, it's initially moving to the right, and eventually it stops at the end. There's a friction force acting. Friction force always acts opposite the motion, so the friction force has to act to the left in this picture. And let's make the system the box. Now, we could add in the earth 
But again, we don't have to worry about the Earth in this situation because there's no gravitational potential energy change. The height is always going to be zero here. And if we do that, then we have an open system. It's an open system because there's friction force that's going to remove energy from the box. And if it's an open system, then we have EI plus work equals EF. At the beginning, it only has kinetic energy. So 1 half mv squared plus the work that's done on it is equal to zero. And work, we have an expression for work. We can incorporate the force and the displacement using W equals Fs cosine theta. So now I have 1 half mv squared plus Fs cosine theta equals zero. I know everything in that expression except for the displacement. I know the mass, I know the initial speed, I know the force, and let's think about what theta is. In that equation, theta is the angle between the displacement and the force. The displacement and the force. Here, the displacement is to the right, the, dis the force is to the left. So the angle between those two things is 180 degrees. So we have 10 newtons times s times the cosine of 180 degrees. If you do that, you get 9 joules minus 10 newtons times s is equal to 0. And if you solve for s, the displacement of the box is equal to 0 0.900 meters. All right, and technically we should have a direction if it's a displacement, so it would be to the right in our diagram. Okay, next one we'll look at. A spring launcher on the ground is used to fire a ball bearing directly upward. The ball bearing has a mass of 0 0.160 kilograms. The spring inside the launcher has a spring constant of 300 newtons per meter, and it's compressed 0 0.250 meters. Find the maximum height of the ball bearing after it is launched. All right, so here's our situation here, and it begins with the ball bearing and the compressed spring bent forward, and at the maximum height, the ball is not going to be moving. At the maximum height, the ball is has a velocity or excuse me, a speed equal to zero. And we want to know the height at that moment. Okay, well, if we make this system, the spring, the ball, and the earth, then it's a closed system. Other than the spring, the ball, and the earth, no energy enters or leaves other than between the spring, spring, the ball, and the earth. So that's a closed system. So we have EI equals EF. EI, the total energy at the beginning. Well, at the beginning, it's on the ground, so there's no gravitational potential energy. It's at a height of zero. But the spring is compressed, so we have spring potential energy at the beginning. That's going to equal the total energy at the end. At the end, the only type of energy we have is gravitational potential energy. It's not moving at the end, so we only have gravitational potential energy. And if we do that, well, we know K, we know the compression of the spring, we know the mass of the object, we know G, we can solve for the final height, 5.98 meters. Okay, you lift a 1.75 kilogram book from the bottom shelf to the top shelf of a bookcase. The bottom shelf is half a meter above the ground and the top shelf is two meters above the ground. How much work have you done on the book? Okay, well, here's a little picture of that. Book starts out at the bottom shelf, goes to the top shelf. You know the mass of the book. Well, if we make the system the book and the earth, then if we do that, then we can include gravitational potential energy in that. And it's an open system because you're the external object. We want to know how much work you've done. We want to know how much energy you add to the book. Well, you're the thing doing the work, so it's an open system. So the energy at the beginning plus the work that you do equals the energy at the end. And at the beginning, the book is sitting on a shelf half a meter above the ground, so it has some gravitational potential energy. Then you do some work on it. And at the end, it has some gravitational potential energy too. A little more gravitational potential energy because it's higher above the ground. So we know everything in that equation except for the work, except for the energy that was transferred by you to the book when you lifted it. So we can solve for that now. If we solve for that, do a little math, we get you've added 5.98 All right, let's say we have a block and it slides across a flat, frictionless surface toward a spring. The block has a mass of half a kilogram and it initially moves at 4 meters per second, 50 newtons per meter. While the block is moving toward the spring, let's say there's air resistance and it causes it to lose, causes the block to lose one joule of energy. We want to determine the maximum compression of the spring once the block slides into it. So here's our situation right there. There's a little diagram with all the information. 
And remember, air resistance is going to cause this block to lose one joule of energy on the way. So, if we make the system, the box, or the block, and the spring, and we can include the Earth, though remember, there's no gravitational potential energy here. This is a flat surface, so we don't have to worry about gravitational potential energy. But sure, go ahead, throw the Earth in there. But if we make the system, the box, the spring, and the Earth, then it's an open system. It's an open system because energy is being removed from this, right? Air resistance is removing energy from the system. If it's an open system, then EI plus W equals EF. EI, the total energy at the beginning, is the kinetic energy of the block. And that's all. There's no gravitational potential energy. There's no spring potential energy at the beginning. There's just kinetic energy at the beginning. So that plus the work is equal to the spring potential energy at the end. Because at the end, there's no kinetic energy. We want to know the maximum compression of the spring. So once the spring is totally compressed, the block isn't moving anymore. It's transferred all of its kinetic energy into spring potential energy. And there's no gravitational potential energy at the end because the height never changes. We can say it's always at a height of zero. So once we know that, we can solve for delta x, the compression of the spring at the end. And if we do that, do a little math, we can solve for the compression of the spring at the end is 0.346 meters. It's up a ramp. There's friction between the block and the ramp. The block begins at the bottom of the ramp, moving at 5 meters per second, and eventually it reaches its highest point and stop. Block and the ramp, and that's height of the block, is 0.750 meters above the bottom of the ramp. We want to determine two things. What's the distance traveled by the block? And what's the angle of incline of the ramp? This is a little tricky. There's a lot going on here. But let's draw the diagram. We know at the end, when it reaches its highest point, it's at rest. So let's think about this. Well, if we make the system the box and the earth, the box and the earth, then it'll be an open system. Now, I'm not going to, going to include the ramp in this system because I don't really know what's going on with the ramp. I know that there's a friction force that the ramp applies to the object, but I know that friction force. So if I include the ramp in the system, then I, I can't incorporate that force into the problem. The only way that I can incorporate that force into the problem is to incorporate it using the work done by friction. So I'm not going to include the ramp in my system here. If I do that, then this is an open system, total energy at the end. At the beginning, it only has kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Then there's some work done by friction, so F s cosine theta, and that equals the total energy at the end. And at the end, it only has gravitational potential energy. So, well, let's see, 1 half mv squared plus f, friction force, times the displacement times the cosine of the angle. Well, the angle between the force, the friction force, and the displacement, well, the friction force is opposite the motion. So the object moves up the ramp, and the friction force is in the opposite direction. So the angle between the force and the displacement is 180 degrees here. And that equals the gravitational potential energy at the end. 0.25 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0 0.750 meters. Now, I'm going to solve for the displacement here. So do a little math. Do a little math. And the displacement is equal to 2.58 meters. And if it's displacement, it should have a direction, so 2.58 meters up the ramp. However, the problem really only asks about distance, so we don't need to give the direction for distance. Distance is a scalar. Distance is 2.58 meters. Now, we also want to know the angle of the incline of the ramp. We can do this because we have enough information to draw a triangle, a right triangle. Up the ramp, it went 2.58 meters. So that part of the triangle is 2.58 meters. The angle or the side of the triangle right here, that's the 0 0.750 meters. And the angle of the incline is right there. So the sign of that angle. If I look at this triangle, the sine of that angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. It's 0.75 meters over 2.58 meters. I can solve for the angle. It's equal to 16.9 degrees. All right. Next one. Let's say we have a spring-powered projectile launcher, and it fires a ball into a catcher, which also has a spring inside it. Uh, the spring in the launcher has a spring constant of 500 newtons per meter, 
and it's initially compressed 0.85 meters. It's also 35 meters above the ground. The spring in the catcher is has a spring constant of 250 newtons per meter, and it is 12 meters above the ground. The ball has a mass of 0.175 kilograms. We want to find the maximum compression of the spring in the catcher after it catches the ball. So there's a lot going on here. Let's draw the picture, try to get all the information in that picture. Here's the initial part, with the compressed spring, and the spring is above the ground a certain height. And then here's the catcher with a certain uh, spring constant, and it's a certain height above the ground. Well, if we make the system, the ball that's being launched, the two springs, and the earth, then we'll be able to include, let's see, well, the spring potential energy at the beginning and at the end, and the gravitational potential energy that's included in there. And if we do that, nothing else is adding or removing energy to the system. Of course, we're ignoring air resistance. If there were air resistance, we'd have to worry about that, and that would remove energy from the system. But no air resistance. It's a closed system. So the total energy at the beginning equals the total energy at the end. What kind of energy does it have at the beginning? Well, it has spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. And what kind of energy does it have at the end? It has spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. Now we can put in the information we know. The only thing we don't know is the final compression of the spring, delta XF. So we do some math. There's a lot of numbers in there. And if we solve for the final compression of the spring, we get 1.33 meters. All right. Last problem. Let's say we have a 5 kilogram chunk of metal sitting at rest on a flat, frictionless surface. You apply a 2 newton force to the right as it moves 3 meters to the right. After you've applied this force, the chunk of metal hits a spring with a spring constant of 50 newtons per meter. Determine the maximum compression of that spring. So here's our little diagram. There we go. And if we make the system the block in the spring, that's really all we need because we're on a flat, frictionless surface. So we don't need to worry about gravitational potential energy, so don't have to include the Earth in the system. And let's see, if it's frictionless and there's no air resistance, then we don't have to worry about those two things. But we do apply a force over a displacement, so there is work being done. You're applying a force, you're adding energy to the system. So this is an open system. So EI plus the work that's done by you is equal to EF. Now at the beginning, the object is at rest on a flat surface, so, okay, zero is the initial energy, and then you do some work on it, Fs cosine theta, and that equals the final energy, and there's only spring potential energy at the end. All right. So, let's see, the force that you applied was two newtons, and you applied it over a displacement of three meters, and the angle between the force that you applied and the displacement is zero degrees. They were in the same direction here. And that equals one half times the spring constant times delta x squared. And if we solve for delta x, 0 0.490 meters is the maximum compression of the spring.